I've got my all birds on. So, Bob, are you well? Yes. Great. You? Great. Yeah, yeah good. Good so far. Um, we need to have a chat offline about um, wooden shingles sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. There's medicine for that, isn't there? Yeah, not yeah, wooden no, ones. No. Not wooden <laughs> ones, no. They wouldn't be any good for you. <laughs> <clears throat> See, Murray's got tidied up too. Stand up a bit higher, Murray. <laughs> <laughs> That's as much as you're getting out of me, Bob. It's jeans, a tidy jeans, but it is jeans. Would it be, <clears throat> be fair, I probably would have had jeans on if we'd been in the chamber. What would Jean say about that? It's a face palm, Malcolm. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> Dad jokes. Right. That is the Anzac flag that I'm flying at the gate today. Was that you, Deborah? Yes, it was. And my knock went through very clear. You weren't the first thing you said the last time. You, your reply was that when you started, you weren't. Well, your voice is a bit probably too, Mark, at the moment. So maybe it's my reception. Well, uh, kia ora coach, everyone. Welcome along to our uh, full council meeting. Uh, Last one of uh, April uh, as we head into um, Easter and Anzac Day. Uh, today's what, 13th of, uh, 13th of April. Um, thank you for those that have uh, joined us today. For anyone that's watching this uh, online uh, today or later, um, congratulations to you for taking an interest in decisions that matter to our community. I'm going to open um, with a karakia and a council affirmation. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a maa kina kina ki uta, ki a maa tara tara ki tai, e hi a ki anā te atukuda, te tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. And the council affirmation, let us affirm today that we as councillors will work together to serve the citizens of Selwyn District, to always use our gifts of understanding, courage, common sense, wisdom and integrity in all our discussions, dealings and decisions so that we may solve problems effectively. May we always recognize each other's values and opinions, be fair-minded and ready to listen to each other's point of view. In our dealings with each other, let us always be open to the truth of others and ready to seek agreement, slow to take offense and always prepared to forgive. May we always work to enhance the well-being of Selwyn District and its communities. Uh, we will. Yeah. Uh, the agenda today uh, has been um, pre-circulated and everyone's had the chance to, to look through the things that are in there. There's a number of matters that we'll cover today. I haven't received any extraordinary business um, to uh, be covered on. in the public part of this um, meeting. Uh, and are there any conflicts of interest uh, that people would like to register for this? Deborah had a couple that was raised earlier. Deborah, do you want to raise those now? Uh, yes, look, I, Sam, had some extraordinary general business that um, I would like to cover in public or discuss in public excluded. Um, so just want to highlight that matter. Um, and also want to declare a standard conflict of interest for tab 8, district licensing, tab 14, private plan change 75, and tab 15, private plan change 78, as a council commissioner on the proposed district plan. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, David, did you want to, to touch on the conflicts piece at the start now? 
Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, I've, I've been asked to make some comments with respect to uh, council commissioners uh, conflicted in, in respect to uh, particularly the two recommendations on tab, give me those numbers again, Deborah, 70, tab 14 and tab 15. Um, the answer is that the, the discussion is as to process, not decision making. So is there a conflict? The conflict is where you are directly involved in the process. In this case, that is simply endorsing recommendations made by an independent person. So it's my view that you have no greater level of conflict than the general public in this matter. Where at direct decision making, the answer would be uh, different, Mr. Mayor. But um, we just, will discuss that a, further with council legal advisor. Can I have a can I have a response? Sorry, can I have a response? Sorry, I've got a couple of interruptions there. I just wanted, David, if you could just finish the last couple of pieces that uh, you you said then, and then Deborah will come uh, back to you. Yeah, sure. So what I was going to say is that, as Councillor Hassan has uh, alluded to, she wants to discuss these in PX. So I assume that's what she was going to do next, but also to advise you that Council's uh, legal uh, counsel will actually be on the line for another matter on PX, so we'll be able to assist that part of the discussion as well. Thank okay. you, David. Debra? Uh, yes, look, I'd just like to highlight that while I accept um, the legal opinion um, being a procedural issue, unfortunately, um, if that was the end of the matter in a discussion around the council table, that would be fine. But I cannot predict um, what other councillors may actually say that interferes or is a, has a perceived conflict of interest with regards to the various hearing panels that we're on. So um, that's why I just want to cover myself um, and just make it quite clear that as a hearing commissioner um, in that process, I am just declaring a conflict of interest. Thanks, Deborah, for raising, and that'll be noted in the, um, in the minutes of those matters uh, as they come up. Uh, the, there is no public forum in today's um, meeting, uh, and we move to the confirmation of minutes. Um, so move. Thank you, Mark. Seconder for that, seconded Malcolm. Uh, there's a couple of attachments which are in there, which were the letters from the Runanga at the last um, meeting, which are attended, uh, amended to the minutes as well. Uh, Councillor Shane, if you have. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, Sam, uh, Kapoi, e David, uh, Kofa Kahaere. Uh, kia ora, thank you very much. Um, just reflecting on some on the uh, public forum from last week, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I just think it's another example of um, rush legislation that, and an unintended consequences. And I think, as I feel, as councillors and and mayors and a mayor, we, this is our literally our job to advocate on behalf of our public back to central government on something that that quite clearly has a lot of cost related issues to our to our constituents regarding uh, the public forum from last week at PC73. Secondly, I'd just like to address um, the, the, the spoken cordial that was uh, captured in minutes last week uh, and my reference to my comments, uh, there's been some changes to the initial draft that I would like uh, re, re instated back into the, uh, the conversation captured in the minutes. I feel that is necessary given the uh, the decision and the topic uh, being uh, once in a generation uh, decision that although perhaps isn't is coming from higher up and may not be our decision, it's important that each of the spoken parts of each councillor councillor is captured uh, for public knowledge. Um, thirdly, just the regarding the attachments, uh, the letters from our Manafenoa partners. Uh, within those it asks, uh, they were actually received quite late, so I'm just interested in the process of receiving um, uh, letters or attachments to agendas that didn't feel we had time to uh, take into account. And one of the parts of the letters suggests that each of the partners is open to 
um, kōrero at some stage, a catch up on this matter. And I wonder if that is either planned or can we uh, accept that and have a conversation with each um, at some point regarding this topic. Thank you. Thanks for that, Shane. Uh, yeah, the process around the letters was um, once the local runanga were aware of the matter being raised at the council meeting, they endeavoured to provide some feedback uh, into the process. So we received that on the one on the day before the um, decision was made and circulated um, on the day uh, as a part of that. So yeah, we didn't we didn't have them for ten days and held on to them. It was just that's where we got them. Um, and you're happy to think about how a conversation, the next piece of the conversation works um, on that piece with our local runanga. Um, on, on the minutes piece, I'm interested just in what you are requesting to change specifically to be. The minutes uh, was my, I sent through my, um, my notes from the meeting or my speech from that uh, part of the meeting, uh, which was accepted in draft and then has been changed again. Uh, so this is sort of around the full comments that were made during the meeting that you'd read from. Yeah. Yes. David, if I can just get you to talk about uh, the way we record our meeting minutes um, and, and what, how that's done and sort of the process around that. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I've had this conversation with Councillor um, Shane as well prior to today. So our minutes are not a Hansard recording. Our minutes are designed to capture the key points that any councillor makes on an item, which helps uh, the reader understand how the decision is formulated. The advice that I provided to Councillor Shane was that if we are going to include his entire speech, as he had initially requested, then we would simply have to op open that offer up to all councillors and ask, does everybody want everything they said? And not only in doing that, you're then setting a precedent for all other minutes. So. It's always been our policy uh, of um, capturing key points. Question is, are we satisfied the key points were captured? And the question is to all councillors, not just, just to one councillor. And at that point, we then move and accept the minutes after that discussion, Mr Mayor. Cool, thank you. It seems like if we were to change the way of doing things, then it's going to require a complete change for Naomi and Therese or anyone else that's involved in the capturing of those minutes. And there's a bit of a departure from the way of thinking about the key the key points um, and the decision that's been made being recorded. And we've got the, the full recording is available for anyone to look at, um, should they be interested in what each of us has said. So I'm not really in favour of everything always, you know, word for word minutes of every meeting being recorded. It would run into the pages. I think adds extra complexity for the recording of minutes. But I'm happy to hear from others who um, would have a view on, on how we how we do our minutes. I'm sorry, can I? Yeah, Deborah, go. Um, just curious with regards to um, how it was perceived by the um, Star News and the report was written up with regards to Shane's comments. Um, and if that's how they were actually recorded in the paper um, and they're not included like that in the minutes, then I think my personal viewpoint is that he has a right to ask. Um, for those direct comments to be put into the um, into the debate, um, that's my personal viewpoint. Thanks, Deborah. Grant, is your hand up for something on the same matter? Yeah, well, I, I, well I'm a bit of in both camps. Obviously, we can't record a verbatim, but if Shane feels that the the um, thrust of his his debate was not included, I think he should have the opportunity to have the the, the um, thrust of his debate recorded accurately. So I don't support verbatim recording, but I do support um, him being having the ability to have his point of view recorded accurately. So it may be a, a redrafting in an abbreviated form, I think is probably what we're asking for. Um, just while I want, I just sent an um, a email to, to raise, um, there was a couple of words that just would want to changing on, on my statements. Um, it's just um, wordsmithing rather than anything fundamental change. Thanks, and, uh, Grant. Oh, okay. right. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. And there may be other councillors who have just had those slight word changes in there and, and they can be included easily. Shane, I guess if there's a, some things that isn't carried in the thrust, if there's a way that you can redraft that and, you know, everyone else is, I guess, I'm not counting the words, but it might have been 25 words-ish or 30 words that uh, has been um, connected uh, that Theresa has sort of 
thrown down as a general thrust of what you want to say. If that's a way forward, um, then let's let's look to do that just to make sure that you're not misrepresented uh, in what you've said captured in the minutes. But Mark and uh, Malcolm, you may have thoughts too. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult for us to respond how the media choose to present what we say at a meeting. Um, they often report simply off our agendas and then they lurk in the in the viewing or in, review the recording of the meeting and report what they want. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to make our minutes a response to uh, the media's response. A member could, if they chose, correspond to the news organisation and say, um, you know, put their case that way, as if it was a letter to the editor saying, no, you got, got it wrong, that's not the thrust of what I said. Our minutes are uh, should be a summation of the debate, indicating the breadth of the debate and not verbatim. Um, this was an issue I struggled with when I first was elected as to, the, to that, and um, I think I'm happy as long as they show the breadth of our debate so a reader at some point in the future can see the the thrust of our discussion. It doesn't have to be verbatim, it's not Hansard. Thank you. Malcolm. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Mark. I, I, was, I was reflecting on um, on those conversations at that time when you were a newly elected member as well uh, and concerned about what was being recorded. Um, I think the status quo is where we need to be. Um, Unlike the earlier days, you can go now and have a look at the council meeting. So um, that we did not have before, and now we do. Uh, I'm in support of um, of uh, of uh, Councillor Epihar getting the the redrafted bits and pieces to put through the gist of what he wanted to say. So I have no issue with that whatsoever. But I think uh, verbatim recording um, uh, is just a non-happen, especially when we have the technology these days where one can look back on what has been said. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Shane, does that address your concerns if we find a way to have a brief um, review of your piece and you can submit that, you know, keep it 25 words or something and that could be included, replace what's there? Yes. Yep. Cool. Thanks Agreed. for the discussion, councillors. That's, um, that's been good. Uh, it was moved and seconded that we have the minutes. Oh, uh, the last matter and the minutes is the matters under investigation, um, which are there. And I just wanted to raise the it's on page 21, just some titles around the headings, um, around what we're looking at on the table would be helpful to have and thinking about reporting back time and when it, when it has come from would be helpful for those that are reading, reading that report. But otherwise, we're looking at May dates for those items to come back and just wanted to raise, is there anything that's missing on that um, matters that people thought we had discussed or had added that aren't there? Nope. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour that the minutes be recorded as true and accurate, please raise your hand. And anyone against, please speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you. Uh, my report is on uh, page 28 of today's agenda. Uh, there's a number of um, appointments there that have been recorded um, for you. And the shout out this month goes to Tammy Reeves. Um, for support around recruitment and um, challenging circumstances, uh, Tammy's done uh, an outstanding job. So thank you, Tammy, for what you do for, for our council and acknowledgement from us um, of the good work. I'll get some chocolate uh, coming your way. Uh, does anyone have any uh, questions or things I'd like to add to my report? Just note that today, um, following this meeting, uh, there's a reform, a water reform uh, discussion that LGNZ is hosting with the uh, C of Tomata Arawai um, at four to five. If we aren't finished this meeting by then, there'll be a recording of that coming out. But given the um, concern that we have and that our community has around the future of water and where that's going, understanding um, around the, uh, it's, it's less about the three waters reform and more about the type of um, limits that are going to be put in place and the way that Tomata Arawai as a regulator is going to um, work with ourselves and the new entities going forward. Um, that could be a very interesting conversation. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mahir. I had been led to believe that you might have been making a comment about your comments on Plan Change 73 at the last meeting um, and how they've been reported in the media since. Um, I just wondered where you were going to comment on that. Sure, I can, can comment on that. Last, uh, at the last meeting, I spoke about uh, the Plan Change 
uh, and the context, I suppose, of the decision makers that our decision makers are in, and particularly thinking about our um, commissioners. Um, my comments were really to lay the, um, I suppose, map out the fact that it's a very complex environment that we're in, uh, and that I have um, the utmost respect for commissioners making decisions uh, at the moment. We've got legislation changes, we've got a district plan in flux, we've got private plan changes, we've got fast track processes, uh, and those complicating factors um, mean that our commissioners' jobs is, I think they do an exceptionally good job uh, in, the, in the environment that we're in. Uh, they were in no way intended to think about changing or swaying the vote that was made, and I think I said that last meeting, that I support the decision of the commissioners and, and voted in favour of um, the commissioners' decision. So, Mark, I think, hopefully that clarifies what I said. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll move my report if there's a seconder. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried, thank you. Uh, the next item is the Joint District Licensing Committee uh, from the Chief Licensing Officer, and I understand Billy um, Charlton is on board today to uh, talk with us. Billy, if there's some news that is private or public that you might want to make public, we just want to say thank you for the work you're doing with us, and anything else private or public you might want to say in a public meeting, uh, you're welcome to, um, either before or after your report. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor Sam and Tina Koro, to both um, and the councillors. Um, first of all, Malcolm, our Chief License and Inspector, apologises for not being able to attend today. Family commitments have um, um, put him in a position of not being able to be here. Um, I take the report as read, but I just want to clarify one point in it, that um, the Springfield Hotels on an off-license um, hearing is um, scheduled for May, early May. Um, this has been postponed on numerous occasions but it is um, set out for May, um, the first week of May, and um, should go through quite um, seamlessly. Um, we'll wait and see what happens there based on all of the information that we've been provided earlier um, regarding the issues we've had, which has led to it being postponed. I did want to just bring to your attention a couple of things. Um, our um, local alcohol policy is due for um, review um, in April 2023, so we have started the process with that. We've had um, a meeting with the tri agencies to start the review, and what we will do is bring that to you um, in due course in a briefing um, to debate and discuss where you would like the LAP to go um, through the process before we bring an official report to council to go out to public consultation. Um, just to bring to your attention, Malcolm, on it, uh, um, for these three things mentioned, um, the Lawn Goat Winery in Burnham, unfortunately, after 25 years of family business, has had to close through COVID. It's a very unfortunate and um, very sad situation for the family. Um, the Dunsandal Tavern is for sale, so I don't know if anybody wants to buy a tavern, but there's one going there. <laughs> um, and the Sheffield Hotel has been um, sold, and the new owner as a builder and he's going to try to restore that to as much to the original as he can so that's good news for the Sheffield community um, and finally based on what um, Mayor Sam said um, I finished with council on the 3rd of um, May I've had 19 brilliant years at council and um, it was time for a change for me to challenge myself and get out my 19 year old comfort zone of Selwyn um, I'm going to the Wymac District Council to be the Environmental Services Manager. Um, it was a very difficult decision for me um, because I've enjoyed immensely working with everybody that I, uh, I've engaged with over the 19 years. But there's a time and place for everything and one door's closing for me and another one's opening. So I would like to thank you all very personally and professionally for all um, your guidance, help and collegiate spirit with working through a lot of um, situations, especially in the regulatory area over the last six years, which is, I've always said, the hardest part of council. And um, yeah, it's been great working with you all. So thanks for that, Sam. Thanks for the uh, um, opportunity to say something. Thanks, Billy. And there's a number of comments councillors might continue to make in the, in the chat box. Uh, I want to acknowledge the breadth of work that you've done for us as a council and multiple um, with multiple hats on, uh, and particularly, as you've said, probably none harder than the regulatory space and banali issues that you've 
um, worked with us to resolve for our community is much appreciated. So thank you very much and really wish you all the best for, um, for your next space just across the river. Ta. Thank you very much. Councillors, are there any questions you have on Billy's report? Can I say mover and a seconder? Uh, Jeff and Nicole, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. To clear it carries. Thank you, Billy. The next item uh, we have is the annual plan uh, consultation document, and it's on page 36 of today's agenda. I think Stephen is going to talk to us about this report. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, yes, um, Calvin is, if Calvin's there, he may also be um, contributing. Um, but the report that you have in front of you is the, uh, I guess, the culmination of the discussions that have been held over recent months in terms of the scope and uh, focus of the consultation document for our annual plan this year. Um, there are two recommendations in the report, and it's important that those are taken consecutively so that um, recommendation one seeks to adopt the draft annual plan as supporting information for the annual plan consultation document. That uh, recommendation needs to be um, confirmed before we uh, adopt the consultation document itself, so it may be helpful to go through um, those recommendations in order. Uh, I see Kelvin's there. Um, Kelvin, do you want to just make any comments in relation to the draft annual plan for, for, for a start off? Sure thing. Just apologies. Just uh, running between meetings. We've had our people team doing a strategy day today, which has been uh, really good and positive moving us forward. And it was good, pleasing to hear Sam recognising Tammy, who is one of our new stars within the team. Um, in regards to the annual plan, we've, we've had two workshops which have been very useful uh, in terms of setting the scene for this year's annual plan. Uh, really, it is a, a revision and an adjustment to year two of the annual, the long-term plan. Um, the, um, the general pressures we're facing, as we've discussed previously, but I'll outline those just for the, for the public, is uh, inflationary pressures are quite large at the moment as, as the general public will be all feeling with fuel prices, um, cost of goods and services. And we're seeing uh, CPI and PPI, so the producer price index and the consumer price index, both lifting quite markedly. And we're seeing uh, in the last 12 months, a PPI moving, which is sort of what we use for construction-based activities around the 8% mark, which is quite, quite uh, significant and certainly something that wasn't expected within the long-term plan. Consequently, uh, the cost of delivering the projects and the services that we, we intend to for the community is increasing. Uh, in a capital sense, that is meaning uh, an additional debt to be taken on. And in an operating sense, it means lifting our rates um, a little higher than what we had anticipated in the long-term plan. So we're uh, an average increase over the over the year across all properties on the district of 6%. And of course, that's going to vary uh, from property to property, depending on uh, the type of property and the valuation of that property. Noting that we've just completed a revaluation of properties and um, we're seeing a situation where some of our, our rural properties have moved uh, a little less than some of the residential and therefore the impact of this rate change won't be quite as high for them. Um, generally, the, the consultation is on uh, a limited number of matters of significance, um, and largely these were all signalled through the long-term plan as, as points that we'd be raising uh, coming through. Um, I think the other, the other point around um, some of the staffing cost increases we've been looking at is really around uh, kick-starting our digital strategy and moving us forward into the into the uh, modern modern technology base. And if we sit back and consider uh, right now, we're we're operating remotely, we're having to do things differently, and the high importance that we have on IT is is critical to the, to this organisation and to our community. Therefore, an investment's required in it. Um, and the other, other increases in the operating uh, space uh, within staffing is a growth district 
means there's higher volumes that we need to deal with. And in our regulatory space and environmental services, the number of building consents are not slowing up in this district. Uh, in fact, in the last month, they were again sitting near record highs, or may have been a record high. And we're not seeing this uh, slowdown in the housing market. And I think the slowdown is more the fact that it's existing properties is still in need and a, a large need to build new properties. And uh, Ralston and, and Selwyn as a whole is ideally positioned in the uh, Canterbury landscape to deliver some of that growth. Um, I will leave it there, uh, Mia, and um, happy to take questions or if Stephen wants to... Um, uh, we might just break this into two pieces. We need to uh, adopt the draft annual plan as the first piece and then following that, adopt the consultation document to go to consultation. So we'll take questions. Thanks, Calvin. Stephen, is there anything on the consultation document you want to um, talk to now? Because otherwise we'll just move into, we'll deal with them both together. We, we move one. Um, so we'll have to pass one first, but uh, we'll do that one after the other. Uh, sure. No, thank you, Sam. Um, I don't think there's a lot to add. The, the consultation document um, follows a, a similar but, but simple and hopefully engaging format in terms of uh, allowing our residents to see the issues that we've been grappling with, um, look at the rating examples, which we've tried to break down into very um, real world terms um, for uh, understanding the impacts on their own situations. Um, the consultation program, uh, the dates are key dates are outlined in the consultation document. Um, we're working through the process of setting up uh, drop-in sessions and other community engagement events, and we'll be um, finalising those over the coming week. And uh, those details will be available on, online as well. Um, so no, happy to answer any questions. Uh, just do note that if there are any um, comments or changes that we need to incorporate into the consultation document, we would need those by the close of day today um, so that we can meet the timelines for uh, finalising and production of the document given that we have a short weekend coming up and consultation opens on Tuesday. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. I uh, just want to say thanks for all the work that's gone into bringing this together. Uh, again, with uh, teams working um, via Zoom rather than in person across council, uh, that just has added to the difficulty in getting this far. And so I want to just acknowledge uh, from both Stephen and Kelvin, your teams uh, in getting us here. Uh, Stephen, I think it's great that the consultation document connects back to the LTP itself, just in its look, uh, and the use of um, imagery uh, within it. Uh, for our community, this is the, the, the chance for some feedback. Uh, that we received lots of ad hoc feedback throughout the year. Uh, this is one really key part where we um, have an opportunity to hear that. And I like that within the document, you've talked about the major projects that are underway now, the uh, new wastewater system in Darfur and Kui, uh, the new hockey and football turfs at Foster Park, which I see uh, uh, one's laid and the other's about to be uh, laid. Uh, the Pines 120 project to lift our wastewater capacity in the Rolleston Town Centre, which has got buildings going um, up on it now. Uh, and then talking about over the next 12 months where the major spends are and our water supplies are receiving $20 million of investment, the wastewater $21 million of investment, stormwater 2.3, transportation another $20 million of investment, community services and facilities, $18 million. Uh, this is all on page 148 of today's document. I just think highlighting some of those key spends for our community helps them see where the, where the focus has been uh, and where the planning and funding uh, now plays out in projects which improve our community. Uh, and then there's the four items which we're seeking uh, direct feedback on um, around the Upper Ellesmere Water Race Network uh, and other water races across the district the land drainage um, changes and ecological enhancement rate in the Hororata Hall, which was talked about earlier this year, and there's now a chance for the wider community to have their say. So I think the document does a good job at um, thinking about the things that are changing, but also highlighting the key thing, key decisions from last year that are just about to be uh, to be implemented. So, so well done and thank you. Um, the only addition that I would like to make is to challenge the use of Tadeo in our documents that go out and. I think we have requested in the past that there be a greater use of bi uh, bilingual language um, in, uh, in council documents, and it's just a little bit hard to see that um, in this document. Uh, I realise it's too late now. We only just have seen this in the last couple of days and it needs to go out, but if we could please have a greater emphasis on that going forward and be on the team to think about 
how that is to be done would be um, appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mark. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. On page 39, we talk about the consultation document being available from the 3rd of April. It's clearly a mistake. I just wonder whether the date is actually, is it next Tuesday or what is the date? And then further on in the document, <clears throat> there's a number of places where um, it talks about um, statements being authorised for issue by the council on TBA. Is that TBA today's date? Just for completeness sake, um, th those two items should be addressed. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Mark. Stephen, I'll come back to you to round up on the questions at the end just so we capture everything now. Uh, Shane. Kia ora, Sam. Uh, thank you very much for the report and um, a great summation there, Sam, of the direction of our district and well done to the staff and for putting that into a, a, a digestible document. Um, as councillors, I picking up on uh, page 47 and just getting ahead of um, possibly some of the questions that we asked, page 47, employment benefit expenses is an increase there. Just uh, interested in how we justify that. Is that, is that a increase just um, a normal increase that happens every year. Um, I know that perhaps that would be a question that would come back through councillors to justify that expense. And just page 76, um, the bottom there, Māori role in decision making and iwi expectations. And I keep banging on about it, but I do appreciate uh, the wording within that to include all Māori within the region. Um, and I know that it's uh, a good opportunity to foster that relationship and I appreciate that being inserted into the document. I know that's it's going to go a long way with um, joining the communities together, all of us. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Shane. Murray. Yeah, just a slight correction there too when we're on page 39. Sam, we've now got invites for deliberations on the 7th and 8th, not the 6th and 7th. So it's, I know it's only a minor thing, but if, it's, if it can be corrected, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks for highlighting that, Murray. Um, Stephen and Kelvin, I'll throw you back to answer any of those questions. Uh, you can, can just confirm those dates. That, um, it is 19th of April that is the, the start date for consultation when the document will be ready. That was a typo in the document. And yes, we have had to, to adjust those um, the dates for deliberation. So it is 7th, 8th and 9th of uh, June. Thanks, Stephen. Kelvin, did you want to touch on uh, Shane's question? Uh, yeah, I'll, first off, I'll, um, I'll deal with um, Councillor Alexander's question around the TBA. The reason the TBA sits in there, of course, is this is a draft um, plan. The TBA is when we authorise the final plan. So this is just a draft of what is sitting there, and we don't want to confuse the matter. Um, regarding Shane's point around staff costs, um, so that's made up of, of two components. Uh, one component being uh, remuneration reviews, which we we mark ourselves to to other councils within our market set, and we've made an assumption around where we see wage inflation heading into the next rem round, and that has been set at four point five percent, and that's uh, in line with what we're seeing across other sectors. Also, the um, yeah, the other point within uh, there is we talked about, I uh, talked about previously that we're having to invest in our digital strategy, uh, district growth, and um, being able to deal with those pressures which require additional staff to manage that. Without that staff, we will not be able to uh, achieve what we want to achieve around digital, um, digital enhancements around the council. And likewise, we will not be able to get on top of the growth we're seeing in the council with building consents and resource consents and other matters like that. Thanks for those uh, clarifications. Uh, is there anything further that councillors would like to raise? Mover and seconder for the report. Shane and Bob, um, let's move in A and B. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, please speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stephen and Kelvin, and pass on a um, gratitude to your teams as well. Next, we have, uh, it's on tab 10 or page 160 of today's document, uh, Community Services and Facilities Group Update. Uh, and just welcome Denise Kidd and your staff uh, to the meeting. And Denise, you can take us uh, through the report. Thank you. 
uh, Tina Koto Katoa. I'm here to, uh, to speak to the tabled uh, community services and, and facilities group update report. The report provides councillors an update for, for your information on the first three months of operation of Tiara Atea. We're pleased with the satisfaction levels our customers are giving us, but we've also had some very, very useful um, and positive suggestions for improvements, many of which we have already taken action on. Two and a half thousand people attended programs that were delivered out of Tiara Atea. We've had 1,645 new members join the library and an average of 439 customers per day. Also within the report, we provide a brief update on the Darfield pool refurbishment project with a full independent and individual report being prepared for June, July to Council. The outcomes we expect from this project involving the Darfield pool are obviously extending the life of the pool facility, but also an extension of the pool activities and programs that are able to be delivered, improved aesthetics and functionality, and some improvements uh, to the entry and to the external aesthetics, inviting the external user into the facility. The report also touches on a modest refurbishment planned for Darfield Library and Service Centre as a fitting gateway to Selwyn. Uh, we also, uh, um, we have for your information, uh, the latest term brochure, and we will send out the link following the council meeting today. The brochure highlights activities associated with water and the Star Waiiti um, associated with Matariki, as well as the New Zealand Music Month. Within the report, there will be opportunity at the end of the discussion to consider if there needs to be further discussion by council on the Ellesmere Public Arts spend planned. But a highlight for us is the opportunity to introduce artist Piri Kaui to councillors to share with council the story of Tehekinga, the sculpture that you see outside Tiara Atea. I'm going to hand over to Pumeria Parata Goodall. Councillors will be aware that Pumeria has the role of Poaheria to council, and she will introduce Piri and add to this presentation. Yakunu, uh, Yakurahi, Nei, Tetukumihi, or Tene, or Naitua Huriri, or Naitiro Hiki Hiki Kiakoto, Tenewa. Um, Irunga Hauking up Puriranga, Tohunga Maori, or Mua Mote Nei, Ika Motetuna. I heard tales of the Maori experts of former times regarding this fish, tuna or eel. According to the Tohunga, tuna was a person uh, from the heavens, and because of the heat there and the aridness, uh, because of the lack of water, and because of the tense, intense heat of the sun, he descended into this world. Piti Hini Wetia, 1880. The tuna tradition is one which has been passed down through the generations. It is recorded in various whānau hapu and uh, uh, manuscripts, and the quote at the beginning was a quote uh, recorded in 1880 by H.K. Tairoa, tells the story uh, of the entity Tuna, his descent into the natural world, and the creation of the conga eel and freshwater eels. It's easy to see from these early recordings that eels were and still are an important mahi kakai for Māori. Taking pride of place in the western courtyard of Te Ara Atea is Te Hikinga, a bronze sculpture uh, created by Ngai Tahu Ngāpuhi Ngā Ngā Te Kahu artist Piti Kaui. Te Hikinga celebrates mahi kakai and expresses the Māori of tuna or eels. Originally sculpted in clay and uh, then bronze, uh, depicts a pōtuna, a parent, and a punua tuna, tuna a young child. Uh, inspired by the narratives of our kaitiaki, tūtiraki whānua, it also recognised the significance of water and the abundance of natural resources. 
um, particular to the name Tehitinga refers to the migration of our eels, uh, which we're just at the end of now, and I still haven't had a feed of them, so I'm a bit disappointed about that. However, uh, Tehitinga continues to tell the narrative uh, that was gifted to Te Ara Atea, uh, nā reira a uh, koutou ngā mema o te kaunihira, uh, nai a te reo mihi kia koutou mō kaha ki te hāwhai tēnei taonga. So, councillors, uh, e te koro matua, Sam, um, thank you for allowing um, our community to share this knowledge uh, and its perspective with Sawan uh, through this artwork te hikinga. I have the distinct pleasure of uh, working alongside Piri uh, to bring this kōrero to life within te hikinga. Uh, Piri is an artist born and raised in Te Waipaunamu. Tui Māori is the backbone of her arts practice. She's a sculptor, a painter, a designer, and so much more. Uh, in 19, uh, 2019, she was invited as an artist resident in Tacoma Museum of Glass in Washington State, uh, and went on to exhibit alongside a number of uh, Indigenous glass artists. She's completed several uh, public art commissions uh, within with Porteru Nano Meitahu, works you might be familiar with, uh, um, Kiri Hau, Resilient Seats, uh, which is situated at the Petitahori Centre, uh, and the, the Bronze Tuna at Te Honunga, the city civic building, uh, and uh, the work at um, Tāporoa Poi, Margaret Mahi. Uh, Piri is a graduate of the University of Canterbury School of Fine Arts, and with that wonderful intro, can I please introduce to you uh, Piri Cowie, Senior Artist, Nato. Ka taunga manu ki te waka o Auraki tauanga. Nei ratapu mihi, mana hau kia koutou te mana whinoa o konei ngai te rua hekeki tēnā koe e te tuakana. Uh, e rere ana hoki taku mihi ki te kaunehira, kia koutou katoa o wai kiri kiri me tō tātou pou, tō tātou rangatira tēnā koe e Sam Horton, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, ka huri au ki te reo pākea, I just want to say I'm honoured to be have this moment to present with you alongside our senior, my senior, poor <laughs> uh, media parata guru today. Um, and just a total of the quarter or that she shared, Te Hekinga celebrates the Modi. Modi for us is, and Te Reo Māori speaks about the life essence, um, the energy of tuna, and that's what I've tried to aim to capture here is the Modi of tuna and why through toy Māori. I aim to capture the expression and movement of our sacred tuna. Te Hekinga is inspired by our, our mana whenua pūrāko of Tūtiraki Whānoa, a tipua who travelled through underground waterways and resided in Rakaia and Te Waihura. When I first heard this pūrāko um, from our mana whenua cultural narrative, I imagined the physical representation of Tūtiraki Whānoa as a tuna, rising up out of the way. He tipua, he tuna, he tipua, he tuna. Tu mai rā ki te ara ātia. Tuna are also known as hao and are a tauka species. They are so precious to kaitahu whānui. Aroham, I'm a bit emotional today. <laughs> um, kia ora koutou. They're so um, precious to kaitahu whānui, to Māori people, throughout Te Waipainamu, Te Nāui, and Aotearoa. But they are a delicacy, and some of us have actually been fortunate to eat tuna this season. <laughs> I'm a bit spoiled. Um, but they are endemic, for whānau that don't know, they're endemic to Te Waipaunamu and Aotearoa. So this is the only place in the world that you will come across a long fin tuna. As, as poor media mentioned, they are a migratory ika, a symbol of resilience and tenacity. Kiri Hau, which was a sculpture in Peter Te Hori Centre, Kiri Hau means um, kiri is the Māori word for skin, and hao is our kaitahu word for tuna. So when you speak of somebody who is, um, has this attribute, kiri hao, it's likening them to the tenacious tuna, who has someone with thick skin and great tenacity. So kiri hao is a beautiful mihi to give to, to a strong friend. But something really um, in my research, which um, I came across was, 
which I find quite powerful, is that they've also lived in our waters, or their tipuna have, for 23 million years. So I, he tipua te tuna. A te hekinga is offered here as a kaitiaki for te ara atia. And really, this is celebrating our toi Māori, but it's also crea creating opportunities for people, our wider communities, to engage with our cultural narrative. And furthermore, consider the plight of our tuna to enter taiao, our natural environment, and wai, which is so integral to our survival, especially now. So, neira te mihi kakoto. In this short time, I, I would like to acknowledge some of our key team leads, because um, like many kaupapa Māori, um, these projects do not come about by the work of one person's hands. So this really encapsulates mahitahi working together and creating an artwork for our hapuri, for our community. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the vision of our mayor for seeing the significance of supporting our mana whenua cultural narrative, our pautuna te hekinga, we're going to get start going through the slides, um, which is helpful, so can't apply. So, um, our pautuna te hekinga, tēnā koe, SM, tēnā koe tō tautoko. Thank you to Pua Media Parata Guru and her kaha, amazing strength and passion for sharing um, the depth of narrative, and I love the corridor today, which is the first time I've heard that, the deeper story um, relating to this place, so tēnā koe. Um, I thought we'd share, we compiled some photos here for you to see part of the process because many of the team leads um, also included um, were, were the property team. We were led by Joe Nicolau, and I apologize for the mispronunciation of her beautiful Greek name. <laughs> but she wove together our landscape architects, our engineers, um, the water team, a lighting team, landscape architects. And in the previous shot, you'll also see um, part of the armature. Also wanted to mihi to Armitage Williams for all of the kaha, the kaha and manakitanga on the ground. Um, so ngā mihi nui ki ngā ringa raupa. But there's a key person who's really important to the presentation of te hekinga, and that is uh, Matt Williams. If we zip back to the other photo <laughs> previously. Matt Williams, he's the foundry man here. And it was his skill um, in casting bronze that really brings this work to life. And he's based here in Ototahi, well, further in town at Ototei Christchurch and Crucible Arts is the name of his company. And we also worked with another foundry, Farrah's, where the bronze was poured. So you'll see that part of, um, um, and in terms of te hekinga, I also wanted to acknowledge by Kath Brown, whose work um, is like a korowai around te hekinga, and that I was really honored to have that um, opportunity to show my work beside such an amazing uh, leader in our Toi Māori community um, from Taumatsu and also um, a mentor of mine. So nō reira, nō kui te maringa nui, it is my honour and pleasure to offer this taonga, he koha te hekinga, he taonga tuku iho, nō muara anō, he painga mō te iwi. Um, we're going to, for those whānau that might not know the process of um, bronze casting, we have some of the photos. So. My part was really working in clay and we created an armature a structure for the sculpture to be made from. So this is a component so we can roll through more mm -hmm. of the photos. And then it's really about um, handing over that artwork to our foundrymen. And you'll see here is a, um, a silicon mould and also fibreglass, um, which was wrapped around uh, the sculpture of um, Te Hekinga. And then he made a wax of that and then actually within what you see here is a um it's called an investment so it's like a ceramic shell that's poured a, that's covered around the wax and then the wax um melts out when the bronze molten bronze is poured into it so this is a very simplifying version of the process that you would have seen um in, in creating te hekinga so once we have the bronze matt has the the um the challenging task of putting this piece back together and so you'll see some of the welds that are created here that's kind of in the lighter bronze areas so that's the welds that he's made bringing uh, my handwork back together and so when I mentioned earlier the different teams this is to give you an idea of what so when you're looking at te hekinga if you're interested in process this is the steel structure 
that um, holds the uh, the bronze sculpture together. And this was um, it, it's very sturdy, so we worked with a really um, skilled engineering team, which promises us that yeah, that's not going to fall over if somebody decides to be adventurous and climb on it. But um, we're really at uh, uh, um, Te Hekinga, this is the patina that was placed on it. And then we, if we keep moving through the photos, you'll see this is um, our lovely poor Dylan. Dylan, our lovely Dylan, Dylan, who's working with the landscape team and just showing you a bit of the foundations for Te Hekinga. And this is our installation day. And I just wanted to acknowledge Nikki and her team. It's the first time I'd actually met them was just to, um, you, you know, they have a huge responsibility now because really it's about letting Te Hekinga go and they, and they are now the kaitiaki for Te Hekinga and also educating people of how we treat toy Māori and how we respect our art form and um, they're doing a brilliant job and have really enjoyed being the kaitiaki for Te Hekinga. Yeah, and this is the Tēnā Hue, Sam, when we came down and shared kōrero, more kōrero about um, Te Hekinga and with the water flowing. And then the final one, um, this is a capture shot of our very small um, rōpū, a whānau, our whānau from Tōmatsu um, and my immediate whānau and a few of the few of the people that were involved in bringing Te Hekinga to life. But um, yeah, tēnā koe tō katoa. Uh, if there are any questions, um, we're open for any questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll hand it back to Denise. Oh, uh, tēnā korua, um, Pumiria and uh, Pari. Thank you for uh, the presentation today. Uh, Namahi for the work done, man. Um, it's so cool to see that up in front of Te Araatea. Uh, and I can't wait till that entrance becomes a key entrance from the town centre, whereas at the moment uh, you have to go around the building to, to, to explore um, and to see it. So thank you for your work and for bringing that to life. Um, it's challenged, uh, as I'm thinking about things now, we've got a Selwyn food exhibition, you know, as a next month, thinking about cafes selling, selling Selwyn. Not, I'm not sure how many Turner are on the menu, um, but thinking about what, what, what is local cuisine um, there's a key story there that can continue to be told as we as we explore what it means to to live and, and breathe Selwyn uh, Waikiri Kiri. So thank you for what you've done. And there's a number of other comments and questions that um, councillors will bring now. Uh, Mark and Sophie. Sophie, were you first? All right, I just want to say thank you for the sculpture. Um, I didn't realise it was going to be there until one day I walked around the, the town senior side of Tiara Atia, and there it was, and I was blown away. It's amazing, and so thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Sophie. Mine is pretty much along the same lines. She's gorgeous. So is the baby. Uh, and, and it's <laughs> wonderful, wonderful to um, hear the story behind it more as well. And I'm hoping that at some point I'll be able to find like a, a written copy to process it a bit better. <laughs> read through it and try to remember it so I can tell other people. But um but I just want to say as well, my my children absolutely love it. More for the the running water and everything else, but they sort of see them staring up at the the faces and everything. And it, it's good. It's introducing them to that whole aspect um of everything else. But uh, uh, as for serving tuna on the menu in cafes, pretty sure we're not going to be allowed to do that until Tapura Miri has had enough. <laughs> some... <laughs> be nice though. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordia. Thank you, Sophie, Shane, and then Nicole. Hi, kia ora. Uh, uh, te roko ki te rāwhiti te putanga mai o te rā, e tū nei te hekenga. Uh, no mai, haere mai, huki mai, te rangatira o tenai te ngai te rua heki heki. Uh, no mai, haere mai, no mai, huki mai. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and it's lovely to hear the reo as well in the hui. Uh, amazing, and I just reflect on our council and the journey it's taken to us to this point, and I'm just so uh, so moved, I guess, and I felt that coming through the, the digital screen. I'm sick of these digital meetings. It would have been lovely to actually hungi you face-to-face at Rangatira Horua. Thank you so much for your collaboration, uh, your donation, and your your spirit in bringing this together. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, tēnā koto katoa.
Thank you. 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 Yeah, I've I've got to echo the count, um, comments of my fellow councillors. It's it's an absolutely amazing piece, and especially since it's it's quite a bit higher, but it's ending up looking looking down on you, and it's just absolutely absolutely great. And it, it combines what we've been trying to get more public art, but it's also art and culture and linking with Tiaratia. So it, it's just having that whole cultural narrative going through. And um, I also echo the comments um, that. Sophie brought up about the actual story and everything to do with it. If we could have that available, because I have actually been asked that before um, when someone had seen it and has actually asked about that information. And so it would be good to actually be able to point that to them because there is so much to that. And it's so good to be able to share those stories that we have. So thank you very much for this. Okay. And yes, we're currently just writing up the stories to go onto uh, our Salwan stories, but also onto our websites and uh, on in Te Ara Atea. So there'll be a number of places you'll be able to see the story. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Councillors, we have a move and a seconder to receive the report. Uh, move Sophie and seconded Mark. Thank you. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Sam, and I had one further question. Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, on, on a more general thing about the enhancements to TRATIA is whether we can go to a QR code type system where rather than having a big narrative like on the sculpture, having a QR code that will link to a resource um, that people can then access because that's we are mostly now familiar with scanning QR codes and things happening. So I'm wondering, um, question for Denise, as to whether that's long-term possible for the displays both inside and outside Tia and across our district, that you go to a QR code type system where people can just scan it and get the story in front of them um, without having to find a plaque or some, some printed material somewhere that is actually a resource that's available. Uh, can do I respond, Sam? Yeah. Just, um, abs absolutely, it's part of the plan. And I guess it, it aligns with uh, Calvin's earlier comment about the, the importance of a digital strategy for council to take us into uh, the modern, modern uh, era that we live in. And uh, there are already plans with, within both the Selwyn Stories work, but also the uh, Selwyn Trails uh, app that we have that allow people to go on a virtual journey or to be guided uh, on a journey virtually. So that's absolutely part of the plan and that's uh, the value of um, the digital world, absolutely. Thank you for that, Denise. It was moved and seconded by Sophie and Mark. Uh, again, all those in favour, just raise your hand. And anyone against, speak up now. Very carried. Thank you, Denise, for that. The next report on here um, is the Selwyn Heritage Strategic Plan update. Uh, so I'll open the floor back to you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I guess following on uh, from, from the commentary that uh, we've just, just preceded us, the opportunity with the Selwyn Heritage Strategic Plan and how we digitally reflect our, our past is also, is also part of the the planning ahead, but what's in front of you today is a bit of an update on the Selwyn Heritage Strategic Plan. And I, I want to use this as an opportunity to introduce Nicola Sutton, who has joined the team at Selwyn District Council as a part-time social community policy advisor. Uh, so providing both social and community policy reports and planning analysis and advice to council. Um, so I will invite Nicola to introduce herself to you. She will summarise the report and Nicola or I can respond to any of the questions that, that you may have in that regard. Thank you, Denise. Tēnā koutou katoa, nō te taipatini ahau, ko paparaua te monga, ko mawhera iti te awa, ko Nicola Sutton tōku ingoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So my name's Nicola Sutton and I'm, um, as Denise said, the Community Policy Advisor 
I come from many decades of uh, working in the community and voluntary sector in a number of different roles um, and more recently have uh, been working at the New Zealand Qualifications Authority as a policy manager. Uh, I joined the community services and facilities team as a policy advisor at the end of January this year. And um, my husband and I moved to Rolleston just two weeks ago. And so um, a very recent uh, uh, residents of the, of the Selwyn district. And we moved down from Wellington. And one of the reasons for moving was that we have uh, four sons, three of them living in the Selwyn district. So one in Sheffield, one in Southbridge and one in Rolleston. Uh, and they've all got children uh, attending local schools as well. And so feeling very much linked to uh, the Selwyn district area. One of the pieces of work that I'm working on is the heritage plan, the development of a heritage plan, which for me is personally quite exciting as I am an amateur historian and have been passionate about social history since I was about 12 years old. Um, so the report that's in front of you today uh, gives a brief overview and reminder of where this, the um, decision was made to develop a strategic heritage plan for the district. Um, and a little bit of an update on the Community Heritage Fund of 50,000 that was um, agreed by council in order to support requests from uh, local heritage groups for work until the development of the plan has been completed. Um, one of the, uh, the, the report actually requests an extension to the plan's development. So originally uh, council was looking for that to be brought back in July August, uh, so both the development of the plan, but also a report to support that. This report is requesting that that be extended, and that is about um, when I went to do the engagement planning for the development of the strategic plan, realised that in order to engage effectively with community and bring them along and have something robust that council can make decisions from, um, we needed a longer time frame because we wanted to sequence some of the engagement activities. Um, recognising that it's really, really important to engage the youth in the development of this plan as well as both um, uh, the makers of, of our future history, but also as the, um, the users and promoters and protectors that are also going to come forward. And so I have a number of youth engagement activities um, planned already that will go ahead. Um, the request doesn't have an impact on budget, so it still fits within that budget. It is just a, a time time re extension request. So the request is for an extension of the draft plan through to the December meeting of council, which is the 14th of December, and then the report to accompany that, which will include some financial analysis um, around how to implement that plan uh, coming through in May 2023. Um, so, uh, open to any questions. Thank you, Nicola, for that. Um, really important to get this update for our community who are really interested in this as well. I think it's important that it's something new, uh, that we get it right rather than rushed. So appreciate the consideration that's been put in to bring this back to us uh, today. Uh, Deborah? Thank you. Uh, can I just ask whether heritage trees are actually, and arboretums are actually covered in this plan? Um, Yes, yeah, so one of the things that I've been doing in the desktop research is to look at what else uh, council's already doing around heritage. And so very aware of the heritage buildings and the protection of trees that are included in the current activity of council and they'll be noted um, as to whether they become a separate activity in the plan or not uh, will yet be decided as we start to write up, but acknowledging that they're already covered in other areas. Thank you. Thanks for that. Do we have a mover and seconder for A and B within the report? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I've got Mark and Bob. Uh, sorry, not Mark. Uh, Malcolm and Bob there. Uh, Shane, have you got a question or comment? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just a comment, really. Uh, kia ora, Koto. Uh, kia ora, um, Nicola. Lovely to have you on board. It's evident mm -hmm. from your presentation and from your report that uh, we're very lucky to have you. Uh, so welcome aboard and thank you for the report. Uh, just page on page uh, 191.3, history and background. Uh, thank you for pointing out uh, that there has been hasn't been enough consultation with the with our runaka uh, mm -hmm. here. So that's that's fantastic that you've picked up on that and and hoping um, that all goes well. I'm sure it will. Uh, 
I'm just aware of a another round of funding um, and wonder how, uh, sorry, there is a, another uh, fund that has been set up for the Runanga and I wonder if there's any uh, colla uh, uh, collaborative work that will draw out of that because I'm guessing in reciprocation there will need to be uh, uh, collaboration with the Salwyn community as well on that. So not a topic for this particular agenda item, but I just would like to draw reference to that and perhaps that's something for the CEO. Thank you, Nicola. Kia ora. Kia ora and thank you, Shane. Um, uh, um, I have started uh, the engagement process with mana whenua and um, uh, are continuing to progress that work and we'll talk to Denise about the, the collaboration around that funding. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nicola. Mark. Kia ora, Nicola. Welcome to Selwyn and Ralston as it's properly pronounced. Um, my question more is to Denise, actually. With the delay in the strategy, what is the funding in the next uh, um, financial year? Is it another 50000 Or did we put in, and I should know the answer, the uh, $20 per household rate? Uh, 50000 uh, has been allocated for year two. Uh, that will carry us through to the point where there's, there may may be some recommendations in terms of where councils' further and in, future investment might be, and what the rates impact may or may not be in that regard. Okay, so so because there appears to be some confusion in, in our community, particularly in our heritage community, with some groups expecting the twenty dollars a household of five hundred thousand dollar budget to be available in the next financial year, that they have simply been overly optimistic in, in what funding may be available. And I just raise it because I want it clearly stated so that people understand there isn't a half million dollars in the next financial year. Um, there isn't a half million dollars. It's currently been made provision for within the uh, annual, annual plan and that's about to go out for consultation as you've just um, progressed. The, uh, I guess the intent with the strategic plan is to get a clearer understanding of what the investment is for and on. Uh, so rather than determining the, the amount of money to be spent, rather determining the, the purpose of the, of the money and then understanding what, what, um, what, what uh, amount of investment that is required from council. But it is absolutely part of the process that will, there will be a report that has outlined clearly the financial uh, uh, options available to council in terms of future investment. The timing for that to be um, tabled at, in July was was unlikely to ever be caught up in the in the annual planning budget pro round anyway. Um, so I think that that may have been overly optimistic. Thank you for that answer, Denise. Bob. Yeah, thanks, Denise and Nicola. I've been involved with this group and uh, I was a bit disappointed, actually, when I found it was going to be put off. But having looked at it, looked at it afterwards and thought about it, if we want to do it and we want to do it properly. And there is a huge amount of work to do this properly. Um, I had a meeting with the Community Heritage Group on Friday who are quite understanding on these sorts of things. They want to see it done properly too. So I think we're all in sync and everyone that I know of um, are quite happy with the way things are going. So carry on with the good work. Thank you. Um, so let's move Malcolm and Bob. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Okay, carried. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Nicola. The next item is on tab 12 of today's agenda or page 195 and it's the environmental and regulatory services update and I invite Tim Harris to uh, present the report. Thanks Tim. And Bob, your uh, hand's still up, so you know. Uh, thanks Mayor Sam and councillors. Um, before I start, I'd just like to publicly um, acknowledge all the hard work that both Billy and Ben have put in. Between them they represent over 33 years of uh, service to Selwyn District, um, so they will be a big loss and will be sorely missed. So uh, just a big shout out to both of those gentlemen who will be leaving in the next um, few weeks. 
Um, so, look, you have the report in front of you. I'll take it um, largely as read. I'm happy to take some questions. I will point out a number of, um, I guess, key points. Um, you'll see from the report and also from the attached um, um, pages of statistics that volumes remain high. And I think Calvin pointed out that uh, March was a record year for building consents received over 300. Um, so there's no signal that um, things are slowing down. Um, You've had an update on the spatial plan this morning, which was quite useful, I thought, and there'll be some further work in terms of the Selwyn perspective on that before the next GCP update um, in, in May. Um, significantly, the um, Selwyn district biodiversity strategy has um, started to be developed, and we had a steering group meeting in March, uh, yes, March, and another one scheduled in a, in a week or two. Um, I guess um, most pleasing is that the compliance um, timeframes for building consents are starting to come back to where they should be. Still a way to go, but they are trending in the uh, in the right uh, direction. I think this time last year, uh, down towards the early twenties in terms of uh, twenty percent in terms of those meeting compliance, we're up over forty percent, and I think the figures over the next few weeks, we'll continue to see that trend. There may be a blip um, given the large volumes in March, but we are trending in the right direction. So that just the, there are just a few points. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Tim, for that. And um, we acknowledge Ben uh, in a previous meeting that wasn't in public. So I do just want to say, um, Ben Rhodes, you've done a, an outstanding job for Council over the time that you've um, worked for us uh, in a range of items from the very local through uh, the district plan and working with the GCP uh, now to ensure Selwyn Waikirikiri's interests are a key part of the future for Greater Christchurch. So, um, Tim, thank you for raising that here and acknowledge both of them um, we have in this meeting. A big contribution and wish, wish them both uh, all the best. Uh, Nicole, you got a uh, question or a comment? Yeah, I do. And um, just to start with, I'll, I'll second about um, ben, and, ben and Billy and um, wish them well with their next endeavours and hopefully we will get some updates of how they're getting on um, as they go through. Uh, my question is around the district plan. And um, so a number of the sections, as has been said in this um, your report, of the proposed district plans have had the hearings and a number of objectives, policies and rules don't appear to have any objections, appeals on them. So what is the process with going forward for some of this to be made operative and when does that happen? Uh, thank you, Nicole. Yes, um, they are challengeable through, uh, so no, no decisions have been released yet. Um, and so those decisions aren't scheduled, unfortunately, till um, later on in 2023, towards the end of that year. Um, and um, that's largely due to the enabling housing supply okay. um, act. So we haven't released decisions yet. So they are still um, challengeable, but you're quite right. Once we do reach that period, which is another year away, um, increasingly provisions that are beyond challenge will become increasingly operative, um, but we're not quite there yet. So um, I hope that answers the question. Right. Yep, thank you for that. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, and Tim, as you said, really pleasing to see the building consent side of things coming, trending in the right direction. Uh, it's a key concern for our community and um, something I get a lot of feedback on. So well done uh, for the things that you've put in place to, to make sure that the team can, um, can function uh, well in that space. Pass on our thanks for the hard work I know that people put in an extra to keep our numbers as low as they can as far as days to um, process consents. Thank you. Uh, do we have a mover and seconder for the report? Nicole, Malcolm, thank you. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thanks, Tom. Next up, we have uh, five waters update. It's on page 215 of today's uh, agenda. Uh, and welcome Murray uh, to the floor and Elaine uh, as well. If she's, yes, Elaine, hello. And uh, I'll hand the floor over to the two of you. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Mayor Sam. Um, we'll start off, um, I was on public agenda, page 191. So obviously, we have a different page numbering there. But the War New Zealand National Performance Review is something I would like to talk council through. I'll try and um, share my screen so I can just show you some slides. I'm not going to go through all the slides. I think there's over 40, 40 slides. Um, but hopefully, 
that is the right um, screen I'm sharing. Can you see that, Sam? Perfect, awesome. Right, hi. So the first slide looks at residential water charges, and we've got Salwyn highlighted down there on the um, horizontal axis. Um, and I suppose the point here is just to show that um, in terms of the water cost um, per 200 kilometres of water, which is deemed to be a typical number of uh, percentage of water to be used over the country, um, Salwyn's particularly cheap. Um, we've always known our water's cheap, but it's always nice just to see this here um, in a national survey. The next slide um, that I'll show you, if this is going to work, is wastewater. Um, so we're right on the average cost for wastewater, um, and that's probably not too uh, unexpected. Um, our wastewater is treated at a very high level in Salwyn. Um, some of the cheaper councils you'll find are probably um, oxidation ponds discharging to a coastal outfall, whereas we've um, purposely pumped all our wastewater up to dry land and um, treated to a high standard and then dispose of it to, to land. Um, so to be on the average is, is really good, um, but more so because of the level of treatment we provide for our communities. This slide takes both the water and the wastewater charge, um, puts them together just to provide a, a total package, if you like, of what it costs for water and wastewater services. Um, and in, in this case here, we are below the average cost um, per household to provide water and wastewater services. I am going through fast because I worked out <laughs> there's 15 slides and if I take a couple of minutes on each, we'll be here for quite some time. So that's why I'm rattling through. Um, the next slide talks about volumetric charges and this is for non-residential use, but um, it's the same for commercial and non-residential. And uh, as you can see here, our cost per residential property uh, or commercial property for water suppliers is really cheap. Um, it's something we're looking at um, changing through this annual plan, um, but the fact remains that yeah, well, well below the, the volumetric charge that a lot of councils would charge. Likewise for stormwater, um, councils use different ways of charging for stormwater services, some through the general rate, some have a target and general rate, um, and so on all of our water services are through a targeted rate. And our target rate, um, well, again, it's, it's one of the lowest, if not the lowest, um, across New Zealand for stormwater services. Uh, some good news stories. This is the uh, average pipe in years. Um, so for for Salwyn, um, very very young <laughs> young pipes. A lot of that's due to our our growth um, and rapid growth in our renewal program. So the youngest um, pipe age by average uh, in terms of water. The same for wastewater and stormwater is a wee bit harder to, um, to, to look across, but one would suspect that our stormwater pipes are also the youngest um, in the country. Most of that is um, due to the new subdivisions and the likes of Lincoln um, and Leiston. So it's all new stormwater infrastructure that's been installed. Percentage of pipes assessed in poor or very poor condition. Um, again, um, sound is not showing up here as a highlight, but it's, it's through here. So um, our assets are of, of very high quality, as you'd expect, because they're so so new. Um, water loss, Salmon um, again is doing really well in terms of our water loss management. Um, Salmon's shown just here. You can see where my mouse, mouse is moving up and down again. So we're in the bar here where it talks about this possibility for future improvement, but we're very close to where you hit a line where it suggests that the losses below this level may be uneconomical um, unless there are some water shortages uh, in the area. So I think we're well positioned um, in terms of our water loss strategy and, and, and um, repairing of leaks and renewal of pipes. Daily uh, average residential use, and probably we should look at this on a trend, but um, we're just above the median. I think in the past we used to be well, well above that, but as we worked on our volume of charge, um, and with the development of smaller sections, we have seen that average use come, come down remarkably. So we are just, just above the average median for our domestic use in water. This was a, a point of improvement from the last year's survey. If you remember, um, our, our report suggested that our fire hydrant testing wasn't quite um, as it should be. Um, there's probably a number of reasons for that, um, but the main one was just the process in the background of data collection and reporting. And so we've made um, a whole lot of improvements to that, that background algorithms of pulling information through. And so as you can see now, we compare really well to um, the councils who are, who are doing their fire hydrant testing. And there's a lot of councils which um, in fact aren't doing as, as well at all. Energy intensive, intensity of water and wastewater networks. 
So these, these are slides which I thought were interesting. <laughs> I don't know if they're interesting to anybody else. But anyway, sal salmon's down here. Um, we do use we do use probably more energy than um, comparable or other, other councils on a um, comparable basis. And I think that's just because of the nature of our district. So for water supplies, we have 27 water supplies. Um, we're pumping water from deep groundwater because of the number of water supplies we have and the number of treatment plants, there's, there's probably some inefficiencies in terms of water treatment um, in terms of electricity that is. And so we are just above the average for that. For wastewater, we're quite a lot higher. Um, but as mentioned before, we are pumping wastewater from our lower, more sensitive environments up into uh, Rolleston. We're providing a very high quality effluent treatment through a mechanical plant um, and then disposing of land. So um, it's not, not un unforeseen or unexpected to see that, that cost there, but it is, it is higher. Um, we acknowledge that. Dry weather overflows, um, we're pretty much at the bottom there, which is where you want to be. Um, we don't have dry weather overflows um, really. The only ones that we've picked up picked up there are um, where an air valve has um, emitted a wee, a wee discharge when it's released air. Um, so I think often these, these measures, it's, it's really hard because it's all about your data collection. So we, we collect a very high resolution of information and we report on that, whereas a lot of councils probably wouldn't even pick up some of those small spillages, which may be a ice cream container of waste, well, that's just dropped um, volume, I should say, equivalent volume from an air valve where we do. So that's that's what those are. Um, as we go through to the next year's um, survey, we've done a lot of work to improve those um, air, valve, air valves and how they work. And, and so we capture a lot of that discharge now as opposed to it being released. And that number will come down even further, which is, which is really good. Um, service properties per kilometre of pipe. Um, yeah, this is almost an inverse type thing. So for Salwyn, we, we have um, not many properties per length of pipe. So if you're, if you're in a, a, an urban area like Auckland, Wellington, you have quite a density of properties. So you need a small length of pipe to service a whole lot of properties. We're still quite rural in nature, although we're becoming more urbanised. Um, so we actually have not many properties, but a whole lot of pipes to um, by water and the same goes with wastewater as well. Um, and that's probably the interconnection pipe works from the Lincoln Prewaltons, West Mountains into, into Rolleston. Um, so the, these, these, the wastewater will probably drop over time. So we even less properties as we expand out to Darfield and Ellesmere, whereas water that will should, should um, increase over the next little while. Uh, capital expenditure to replace existing assets. This is our renewal profile, re renewal works um, as a portion to depreciation. So as a mine councils, we don't fund depreciation, um, fully fund depreciation. What we fund is the renewal of pipes over the next 30 years. So we look out and see what pipes need to be renewed in this 30 year period, and we 100% fund that, but we don't fully fund um, depreciation. So that's something perhaps we can look at in the future. That said, um, it's encouraging to see for water, we have actually had quite a, a large capital program to renew um, uh, older water assets. So 142% of depreciation, 200 and 124. So that's just showing that council really is investing in its water services. Um, wastewater is slightly below, um, the spend is slightly below the depreciation of a whole life um, cost. Um, and I think that is because we have been focusing on water, but these, these by no um, means are under investing. That's um, sort of a good result. And stormwater at 115. So again, really good. So this is the lucky last slide. Um, uh, capital expenditure spent per property connected to our network. Um, so with the exception of stormwater, which we have a very small network, um, wastewater, we're spending a lot more on average per property and water is also above the average. So that just suggests that council is doing a really good job in upgrading its water supplies. This is a snapshot of one given year um, and council has been investing over a far longer period. So um, that's also a good result. I'll stop sharing my screen. Sam, do you want to race through the whole report and come back for questions or should we pause there? Keep going. Awesome, okay. so. Over the page, one water strategy. Um, I don't plan on talking about that today. Um, everybody is well aware of that. Just to say that it's going going really well. Um, Sam, you may have some comments about our engagement with Runanga um, later on. 
Uh, the next next item talks about the blueprint for drinking water. So that's a sort of a step down from the strategy. And the second image under that chapter talks of, or has a uh, puzzle piece type image showing how the different strategies and documents fit together. So the one water strategy is at the top, um, asset management plan is probably at the bottom, sucking all that information into it, and the um, the drinking water blueprint somewhere in between. So it's more of a infrastructure focused document. The, um, the one water strategy will speak into that, um, and then that will then feed down into the activity management plans. I think, um, no, I'll leave, I'll leave that there, and I'll hand over to, um, no, I won't, sorry, I'm jumping around a wee bit, there's been a few meetings today. Uh, the next one is Tamata ROI submission on technical documents. Um, that's uh, in, in the agenda at the back of our report, so I'm not gonna go through that, but um, the previous meeting, Council delegated staff to make a staff submission on that, so technical document. And I've just included that submission for your information. Um, so have you take questions on that at the end as well. Now I shall hand over to Elaine to talk about um, Springfield Water. Thanks, Murray. Um, so there's a few other items in the report, um, and all of them can be taken as read, but I will just focus um, in on Springfield Water. Um, so we're all aware that Springfield Water Supply has been under a precautionary borrow water notice um, over the last two months. And during that time, staff, our consultants and contractors have been working to solve the problem, looking at short, medium and long term solutions, all being and them all being considered. It's one of those problems that has multiple layers to it. And they've all been worked through with staff and guests investigating the causes, but also a long list of possible alternative sources and solutions with input from the community. We currently have short term relief measures in place um, and have discussed the long term solutions previously. But there are two items of work um, to relieve pressure in the community and um, that are required in the medium term. One is the river works that are currently in progress, um, and that's to move the Kauai back to its original course just upstream of uh, upstream of the current intake. Um, and that's following multiple events over the past year. We've been working with ECAN um, to undertake this work with using emergency powers and our contractors have started um, work in the riverbed today. The second and the focus of the addendum is the construction of a pipeline to allow the connection of the Sheffield scheme um, to the Springfield water treatment plant. This would allow us to, poten to potentially supply Springfield fully from the Sheffield source or a minimum provide a dilution factor uh, a dilution factor to the Springfield source and bring water back within compliant treatment parameters. This option also helps long term with resiliency in both schemes. Um, a route plan and details are provided within the addendum um, and it is our recommendation that um, emergency funding is approved for this project and I'm happy to take any questions on that. I think probably that's it in terms of the report itself. I'm so happy Sam to move from there. Thank you. Thank you, Murray and Elaine. Um, we had a, a presentation from the museum this morning, and they, they love their graphs too, uh, particularly the one graph that shows that the cost per visit um, is uh, very favourable to them. Um, it's, it's good to see multiple graphs all showing uh, where we were at rather than needing just to select one uh, to show that actually someone is in a, in a reasonable place and a very, very, um, a very good place, should I say, far more than reasonable uh, with, with a lot of the metrics that are measured. Uh, and even the fact that we can measure everything, and Murray, you mentioned the depths that we go to to make sure it's measured and reported, um, that's not necessarily universally true across all councils. So um, great, great to see the good work that the team uh, that the team has done there. And if we are going to pick on a graph, I suggest we make our own one, which would be uh, pipe length connection density divided by charge for service, which shows that even though we're very spread out, um, we still have a, a, a very low charge uh, for that service. Um, one of the items that was touched on there was the One Water Strategy, uh, and I have met with uh, both chairs of local Runanga, uh, and we talked about how we might progress that discussion in the first instance. Uh, they're keen to have something that's less formal than a, a working party, uh, sorry, less formal than a terms of reference subcommittee, uh, and just use a working party type model um, for that with continued reporting uh, to each of the organisations, including our council, uh, and with four people uh, on board, so there's a total of 12 rather than having it spread uh, too widely. I mentioned in my update to councillors last week that I suggest that be um, Murray and myself with Nicole and Sophie. And uh, Nicole and Sophie are both uh, appointed members to the uh, Zone Water Management Committees and just think that linking in the um, work that the Zone Committees are already doing uh, with this work saves on the doubling up and going backwards and forwards. So 
um, the initial work would be um, a drive and a, and a look around at what's there to make sure that everyone's on the same page as the current state of cell and water. Uh, and the, then there'll be uh, individual conversations with the likes of Trust Power and Lake Coleridge, uh, CPW and the work that's going on right across the district uh, there. There's own committees themselves, uh, both Runanga, uh, and we'll pick up particular conversation points um, along the way. So that, that was the, the general proposal from, from that group um, and keen to hear any feedback you might have on that uh, as well. Mark, uh, Nicole, and Bob, and then Murray. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Murray, for all the graphs. Um, it really is hard to pick a select of a set out of the many. Um, on the Sheffield to Springfield pipe route, um, I have a recommendation or a request, actually, based on the performance of the installation of the uh, Darfield to the Pines um, wastewater treatment pipeline is that the, could the contractor keep their areas of closure much smaller and related to where they're actually working rather than clothing great swaths of road where they're not actually working? It's a great disruption to the community um, when great swaths of roads are closed and there isn't a contractor to be seen. So as they work their way along Tramway Road, my request would be that they keep their areas of closure much more localised and related to where they're actually working rather than just putting a road closed at either end uh, and disrupting the community for a much longer length of time. My second question is related to the operating costs. I presume we're having to pump. There's not a gravity feed from Sheffield to Springfield. And where will the funding for the operating costs, is that going to be met out of our current district-wide water rate um, funding that pumping of that water? Thank you. Mari will take it, and uh, Elaine will take a note of the questions and comments as we go, and we'll come back to them at the end. So Nicole, Bob, Murray, Deborah. So um, my question's around, so the graph of um, average pipe age, and it shows that we, we've got pretty much some of the newest pipes in New Zealand. Uh, on Radio New Zealand this morning, it talked about the amount of as, asbestos pipes there are in Christchurch mm. City. So... Um, how much asbestos pipes have we got in our area? And if we do have the pipes, is there a um, program that we are replacing those? It is what Christchurch City said they were doing. As part of that piece, it said that, um, <clears throat> that there had been had been asbestos measured in water samples that were taken from fire hydrants and out of taps, but it was below the level that is okay, um, okay but um, obviously it is something that has been raised in the public arena. So I'd be interested to hear from our perspective where we sit. Thanks. Thank you for that, Nicole. Bob. You're on mute, Bob. Oh, for a t-shirt, Bob. Yeah. Um, thanks to the staff that have worked on the Springfield uh, work that needs doing. I know the community have appreciated the public meetings, and so have the Township Committee. I've had quite a lot of people ring me back saying, thanks for at least talking to us, and we know there's a problem. But one of the things is that, I would like to make sure that this is really a priority job because every day that it takes is a day that we've got people leaving their home each day to go to and have a shower, do their washing and all those things. So I'd like to just make sure that it is done as soon as we possibly can. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. We'll get Elaine's comment on timeframes um, after this. Murray. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine and Murray. Um, just a couple of quick, a few questions on this. Um, I guess the first one is, ha have we covered awful costs? We don't want to be in the position we were with the other contract that we've got professional fees and things not allowed for. So I just want to be really reassured yep. that we've got all costs covered off. Um, are we sizing this appropriately? Um, I, I'll just note there, it says, you know, this will be temp temporary supply for, for Springfield. It worries me, is it, is it a stopgap measure or does it fit with our future, um, um, our future reticulation? So it's not going to become redundant. 
uh, and I guess the, um, the add-on to that is it appropriately sized for growth. And uh, equally importantly, in relation to Bob's last question, do court have the capacity to fulfil both these contracts at the same time? Thank you, Murray. And I'll be noted and commented on in a minute. And Deborah. Right. Um, I've just entered in chat. Thanks, Nicole, about the um, asbestos in the pipes. Um, I've put a chat comment with regards to always the reply. I know that we do have a lot of our older communities in Springston, Prebleton, Lincoln, Taitapu, all with asbestos pipes delivering water. Um, and the other issue is that with regards to an earlier comment, I've also put in chat about, you know, the working party. Is it possible to include the Ellesmere Sustainable Agricultural Group um, to have a rural perspective um, from the ground that has just been given a large trance of money um, in regards to um, the rural having a voice? Thanks, Deborah, for raising that. They'll certainly be one of the groups that we connect with and work with. At the, at the moment, it's thinking about how Council and Runanga set up the scope in terms of reference around what the um, One Water Strategy actually does and delivers, but certainly uh, sustainable agriculture, Alice Sustainable Agriculture will be a key, a key part of the discussion and what we land for that One Water Strategy. Shane. Man, T-shirt sales will be up. Um, Thanks, Murray. I really appreciate your uh, your graphs, mate, and it's such an in-depth report. It's very valuable uh, uh, to me anyway and, and to understand that. So thanks very much for all the effort that you put into that. Uh, just a clarification, confirmation around the comment that you made of uh, that council don't fund depreciating asset in terms of water asset. And is there a part of the operational expenditure that is attributable to maintenance um, there for the... the um, reducing the depreciation on that asset. One of the things that stands out from that report is the fact that the, the infrastructure is fairly new. Uh, well, it is new, brand new, basically, and there'll be some more brand new stuff going in there. So in terms of on a national scale from the three waters perspective, it would seem that uh, we'd be fairly low priority with any of these uh, new uh, projects that would come along. So in reference to the um, Sheffield, Springfield, uh, the key word in that, and Murray's nailed it was the um the word temporary is there a master infrastructure plan um and forgive me if i, I should already know this but is there yeah, is there a an infrastructure master plan uh on this particular subject thank you that's uh me. thank you shane grant <clears throat> thanks sam uh, can you hear me yeah, no, sir. Um, I one water. That's um, quite exciting that uh, Naita who come back and, and um, you know enthusiastic about it. But I suppose it concerns me. I guess that um, I ask you to reflect on it, Sam, or, or give us the feedback. I suppose we don't appear to have had that meeting where our our partners or our, you know our Tamutu um, friends have come and talked to us about what we want from Three Waters Reform. It seems that part's been missed out of the discussion, and, and um, you know, it's ended up with Naitaki going straight to, to the, the central government reform. But that part of our relationship seems to be missed out. And I think Shane raised it earlier. I mean, where does that fit within what you described in One Water? Because One Water to me seemed a lot better solution than what we're ending up with now. Right, you're requesting around uh, them presenting their views on free waters and discussing that with us, or are you asking? No, 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 no not, not asking that. I think um, what what a, when we had this, this partnership, this celebrated partnership that Selwyn and, and Tamutu is, is to her really supposed to have, well, it doesn't appear that they've ever come to us or we've not got in the table together and said, well, what does Selwyn want out of three waters reform? That part's been missed out completely. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's where there hasn't been a discussion or a joined up way of uh, thinking where we come to. And I, I see this one water piece is um, helping identify and rectify that Yeah, as well, Ray. Because, because, you know, it seems that um, perhaps in the absence of us having that meeting, they've gone straight to this mega entity, whereas we had a potential solution, which was a catchment based approach, which probably never got past the starting gate because it wasn't put to, their, put to that, that debate table, was it? 
Uh, the regional work was uh, originally the regional um, work or sub-regional work to begin with. Uh, the mayoral forum worked with uh, Naitahu to try and understand what a Canterbury or a, a sub-region piece of Canterbury might look like. Uh, and pretty, there was a report that was circulated to us probably two years ago now. So they were involved in that initial work, uh, but it was on a... I guess what I'm saying, Sam, I would challenge that assertion. The mayoral forum is not Selwyn. Selwyn is 10 councillors and a mayor sitting around a table. Selwyn is not a mayoral forum. And that's 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 the challenge we've got in front of us, is that we're having a subset making decisions for Selwyn, but it's not Selwyn, is it? Yeah, and agree, that's what I'm saying. It was a regional discussion, not really down to the level that we're at as a district. Yeah. Grant, are you happy that it'll be um, covered though through this one waters work moving forward? That actually the understanding going both ways is going to going to be enhanced. Well, uh, look, I don't want to relitigate last week's decision. I know that's been lost, but I, you know, I, I reiterate my position that I feel a great opportunity has been lost for Selwyn. But you know, that's that's not relitigated. we have got to move on. But um, I certainly feel that you know that that assertion that that our partners are really keen on one water now seems to fly in the face of the fact that, you know, we had an opportunity to have something better to sell. So, and we've missed, we've missed that consultation. It never happened. Okay, thank you for that. I'll, I'll come back to Murray and Elaine to comment on the, the questions and comments that were raised before. And I just suggest that on uh, our recommendations we've got that we received the report, that we approve Nicole and Ada B, that we improve our councillors, Nicole Reid, Sophie McInnes, uh, Murray England and the Mayor to be appointed to, as STC reps on the One Water Strategy, uh, which we just confirmed with our Runanga reps that we've made progress uh, around that. So Murray and Elaine, I'll uh, hand to you. Um, I've written out some notes, so perhaps I'll rattle through and then where I get stuck, um, <laughs> I'll lean on um, Elaine to help fill in the gaps. Uh, so in terms of the first one was about traffic management um, for the pipeline, if we can minimise that disruption. I suppose if we have a balance, we want to um, you know, get the pipeline installed as fast as we can, but we also want to um, limit disruption. So we, we take that on board. Um, Councillor Alexander will do our, do our best in that regard, but we do also want to get the pipe up there as, as fast as we can. Um, electricity cost to pump. Yep, that comes under the district-wide rate. Um, you could argue that we've spent less on electricity than we perhaps would have done if the summer was a bit hotter. Um, but also to reiterate, this is, a, this is a temporary option. So we're not looking at continuously pumping water up for the next 50 years. This is something that we're trying to get through now um, to provide relief for the for the Springfield community. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going in order of the councillors' uh, comments here. In terms of AC pipe, council has around about 3% of its network in um, specialist cement pipe. So it's a very small amount. Um, it's probably actually less than that now because we have been targeting um, specialist pipe renewals um, over the last couple of years. And probably by the end of next financial year, there'll be no more AC pipe in Rolleston or Prebleton. So that's sort of covering um, Deborah's comments. Um, AC pipe in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the pipe can actually perform quite well. Um, however, just the way it's jointed and a few other issues which will be coming up now, we have made the strategic decision to um, fast track the replacement of that. So to reiterate, less than 3% of our network um, is AC pipe. It's all modern materials now. Um, yep, Springfield, priority job. Elaine, do you want to talk about the timeframes for um, that pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you might need to mute, Murray. Um, yep, so absolutely, um, the Springfield-Sheffield connection would be a priority job. Uh, we're looking at the longest lead time is in terms of getting power connection to the pump station that would be re required in between the two um, townships. Um, and so we're kind of bound by the timeframes for that, but in terms of getting the pipe order and the work itself, that should be relatively quick, which also slightly comes into the road closure query, um, just in the fact that it's a different methodology compared to what they're doing on Pines to Darfield. Um, we'd be, the trenching method is different and much quicker in terms of what would happen there. Um, so we'd be mole ploughing in rather than open trenching for, for this connection. Um, and yeah, so we, once the pipe orders in, um, we have pipe to hand to stock that we can use to start the project. Um, so we're looking um, at almost being able to start immediately um, with the hopes that it should be up and running um, by July. In terms of um, cords capacity? Uh, yep, so 
a lot of the work um, would be done by a local subcontractor um, who has the capacity to start um, immediately. And then the mechanical work that's already been agreed and CORD have capacity and they know that this is a priority job. Perfect. Um, in terms of the long term, uh, you know, is, is, it, is it the right size pipe? Are we putting in a solution that will feed us into the future? <sighs> You know, um, Springfield has potential to grow and will grow to an extent that that pipeline won't be able to provide um, the full capacity of water up to that supply. Um, and that's but that's also balanced on the fact that, well, actually, the Sheffield water, water supply consent also would not be able to provide that water up to that capacity and takes water from a sense of environment. So the long term solution is not to pump Sheffield water up to Springfield. Um, the long term solution is likely to be um, a membrane filtration plant at Springfield. The pipe, however, is of capacity which it could fully supply the Sheffield supply into the future, including growth from Springfield. So we can supply growth um, development from Springfield down through to Sheffield. And of course, that works in our favour in terms of gravity um, and um, electricity costs. Um, I think the, the blueprint will also speak into this sort of matter into the future um, as, as an in addition. The Ellesmere Rural Agricultural Group, yep, for sure, they'll be definitely a key stakeholder to talk to, um, uh, along with ECAN, the Zone Committee, and uh, other such, such organisations. Money on ep, um, OPEX, just, just on that depreciation and not fully funding it. Um, so we do actually fund a sort of a pseudo depreciation, so it's not like we're not putting money away. Um, so we look over that 30-year period and we have banked that money to supply that, and so that 30-year period is a a moving average. Um, so we are, we are in a way funding some depreciation, but not, not 100%. It's probably in the order of 80% or something in that, that, that um, magnitude. Um, and our operations, of course, does focus on trying to get the most out of our assets um, for sure. I think that summarises most of those questions. Elaine, did you think you had anything else down that we need to answer? Um, no, I think you've covered all of them, but could be wrong. Thank you for that. There's one other question in um, chat, which I'll just read out here so it can be captured. Um, are we the 3% of RAC pipes that uh, we still have? Are they a priority for um, addressing or have they just been addressed based on leaks and renewals? I see. No, thanks, Sam. So our renewal profile is based on a, on a number of things. Um, so pipe type is one of those. That sort of helps bump AC pipes up on that list. But we also want to make sure that if we have for example, a lot of our focus on renewals has been in the rural, um, agri rural um, water supply schemes over the last couple of years, places we've had breaks, leaks, um, um, just trying to resolve those issues. And we also want to, to tie in with capital works. If our guys, if our rowing team is going to put in a new tar seal, we don't want to come in and, you know, two or three years later and renew that, that um, pipe and then disrupt that whole work. So there's a whole raft of things we take into consideration. Um, so, but that said, we have put a, a focus on AC pipes, and so majority of those will be replaced over the next couple of years, and we're down to very, very small percentages after that. Thanks, Murray. Marielle? Yeah, just the one remaining one was, have we covered all, full, all aspects of costs involved? I'm just thinking specifically around um, the Darfield pipeline of professional fees, which came back to bite us later. Um, Lane, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, so in the number presented in the report, there is a contingency um, in there to allow for any additional professional fees that we could need. Um, and I'm, I think we're quite comfortable that that number will cover it. Thank you. Brad? Uh, I think there was a question asked, which hasn't been answered yet. Is, is, this is regarded as a temporary solution. How far away is the permanent solution? So if we're spending 1.2 million, is it for one year, two years, three years solution until we get the final solution? You know, what's the cost benefit analysis here? Yeah, so there's money um, that's been budgeted uh, in the annual plan for next financial year to construct uh, that membrane treatment system. Um, we're of course looking at all, all options and if we find a, a magical source of fresh water that's close by that we can um, use instead, then we'll of course go that way. But that source of water hasn't yet presented itself. Um, so the, the time frame for a membrane, um, I, I imagine it's from, from this day, it's probably a year and a half away to bring up into operation, but Elaine, you may have something more specific than that. No, I th you're right there, Murray. It'd be about that time frame. 
Thank you. I guess you. I was concerned about what you know the obsolescence, but you've assured me that um, there's a possibility of actually supplying the water back to Sheffield, which at least gives you the we're not wasting money. Yep, no, that is correct. Thank you for those answers um, and the conversation that we've had so far. So there's three things to move. One is that we receive the report. Secondly, that we approve Nicole, Sophie, Murray, uh, England, and the Mayor to the One Waikirikiri Water Working Group. And three, that we approve staff to negotiate and award the Sheffield to Springfield Water Supply Connection. Is remover and seconder, Mark, you're moving. Seconder, Bob, thank you. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, please speak up now. Jenny, that's uh, in favour, yeah? Declare, declare it carried. Thank you, um, Elaine and Murray, that's great. Yes, I was in favour, Sam. Sorry, the hand must have been a bit slow. That's right, it was just a video feed. All good. Uh, next up, we've got private plan change 75. It's on page 276 of today's agenda. Um, and today we have Jocelyn, I see, joining us. Jocelyn, if you'd like to talk us through the report. So this, um, good morning, oh, sorry, good afternoon. Um, Plan change 75 uh, was a rezoning request, private plan change within Rolleston. Um, it's gone through the required processes under the Resource Management Act and the commissioner has pro um, provided us council with a recommendation, which is before you to consider uh, to make a decision on the plan change. Um, Plan change 75 is uh, on the Lincoln Rolleston Road. It uh, will provide for uh, about 25 hectares and um, upwards of 300 households, I think, from memory. Um, the recommendation from Commissioner Caldwell is that the plan change be approved and that the uh, operative district plan be amended to include a new outline development plan um, reflecting this zone, this area as residential with a living Z zoning. Any questions or a mover and seconder for um, this move? Murray Lemon seconded. Sophie, thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? No. All those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thanks, Jocelyn. The next one's Plan Change 78. Thank you. Plan Change 78 is just to the south of Plan Change 75. Um, it is a large area, uh, 63 hectares, um, sought the, the same rezoning request to change from a rural in the plains to living Z zoning. Um, again, through the resource management processes and the recommendation before you from the commissioner is that the plan change be approved as proposed. Um, again, it would incorporate a new outline development plan into our operative district plan, showing how that area would be developed. Cool, well, thank you. I move and seconder for this report. Jeff and Sophie, thank you. Any questions or comments? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone again to speak up now? To clear it carries. Thanks, Jocelyn, for that. We now have a register of documents to be signed and sealed. Mover and seconder for approval of those. Malcolm, Jenny, thank you. Uh, any comments or questions? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. And that brings us to the end of the public uh, portion of our meeting. Uh, so thank you very much for those that have joined us for this. I'll just ask for a resolution to exclude the public. Um, Nicole and Murray, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. And we'll adjourn our meeting uh, for 15 minutes and join back at 3.15. Thanks, everyone.